Florida man fools his flock. Cyril Seron, le champion. The Sweetness and Light Alliance. For the Diplomacy Broadcast Network, I'm David Hood, and this is Deadline, DBN's monthly news program. Dateline, April 2021. For our feature story, diplomacy is a game in which players sometimes lie, cheat, and steal to get what they want on the board. We give awards for the best backstab of the tournament, the much sought after Golden Blade Award. There are t-shirts available online with the long repeated slogan that diplomacy has been destroying friendships since 1959. On the other hand, the hobby is full of wonderful, empathetic, reliable folk who are clearly not dastardly, terrible people. <laughs> Another old hobby saying is that you could trust a diplomacy friend with cash with which to make your mortgage payment, but you just can't trust them to stay out of Belgium. How can all of these things be true? Do we even have ethics in diplomacy at all? What is the interaction between our hobby behavior and our real world sense of right and wrong? We'll explore that topic later in the program. But first, a look at headlines from around the world of diplomacy. Former world champion Cyril Sivon has added yet another notch to his diplomacy belt, along with an automatic bid to next year's DBN Invitational by taking first place in the inaugural French language virtual event, the Championnat du Monde Francophone Virtuel de Diplomatie, which was held the weekend of March 27 and 28. This championship tournament was intended as a boost to the francophonic hobby in general, and is obviously a welcome addition to the list of virtual tournaments created in our hobby since last May. In other tournament news, George Zhang held his second annual GUDCon that same weekend, this time virtually, with Morgante Pell of Vermont taking the title in that event. Brandon Fogel won the DBN Broadcasters Brawl, which took place on March 20th by, of course, stabbing the East as Russia. And rounding out virtual event news, the 2021 Whipping Tournament run by Adam Silverman on April the 10th with a second automatic berth to the DBNI on the line was won by California resident Jason Massbaum, his first tournament win ever with perennial powerhouse Matthew Creel of Washington State coming in second, and in her first event ever in our face-to-face -face tournament, Katie Gray of Indiana finished in third. Whew, that's a lot of tournament news. Brace yourself, folks. A recent academic article argues that diplomacy is a game very adaptable to teaching international relations to college students, just so long as the game's objectives are modified. Michael Matlin writes in the journal Simulation and Gaming, and I quote, the dog-eat-dog -dog world portrayed in diplomacy is not particularly useful as a simulation of actual contemporaneous international relations unless you happen to be stationed in Syria. Matlin suggests, end quote, Madeline suggests that instead of a Hobbesian war of all against all, other philosophical ideas from John Locke or from Immanuel Kant could be put into practice in the game by altering the objectives or victory conditions to emphasize more cooperative player interaction. He has put his ideas to practice by designing and testing a university course involving team play, the use of mediators, and the goal of achieving negotiated win-win results among the participating teams on the board. A link to his fascinating article is in the show notes below. No word yet on what his players will call the Anglo-French Leviathan Alliance, since he's ditching Thomas Hobbes and all that. Maybe call it the Sweetness and Light Alliance. Moving on. DBN's new program, League Night, premiered on March 13th, featuring coverage of that day's opening rounds of the 2021 Virtual Diplomacy League, as well as the Tour of Britain games from the weekend before. In addition to VDL and TOB coverage, League Night will also be covering games from the Asia Pacific League, the French Language League, important local club championships, and potentially other club or league play as well. League Night returns on April 17th to cover the next edition of VDL games. 
it is not too late for you to sign up to join the fun of the Virtual Diplomacy League by choosing that role in the VWDC Discord server. And if you are excited about all this club, league, and tournament play of diplomacy lately, then you might just need to be the next club and tournament editor at Diplomacy World. So pay attention about four headlines or so from now on this very broadcast for more information. Yes, folks, we call that foreshadowing. You've already heard the news about recent tournament winners, so now it is your turn to add your name to that list because there are two more tournaments right around the corner. The E-Carnage Spring Edition Virtual Tournament will be run by Dave Maletsky with one round on Friday, April 30th and two rounds on the 1st of May, all hosted on the Carnage Discord server. Dave will be using a modified version of his Carnage scoring system, as well as providing opening and closing ceremonies by video. Then DixieCon will hold its event virtually, the 35th annual one, on May 28th through 30, with one diplomacy round each of those three days, plus a speedboat tournament, a terraforming Mars event, virtual barbecue, and a whole lot more. Visit www.dixiecon.com for more information, and remember to join the VWDC Discord server, which is where the 2021 DixieCon will be housed. Let's talk about an exciting project on the VWDC server with Utah hobbyist, Natty Schaefer. Well, hey, Natty, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, David, for having me. Sure. So tell us a little bit about where you are and what you do and what got you into diplomacy. I am in the Western United States in Salt Lake City. I am a lawyer here and I work for myself. I'm my own boss uh, at a solo firm here in Salt Lake City. I got into diplomacy probably late high school or early college. My sister-in-law asked me what I wanted for Christmas and I named a bunch of board games she had never heard of. So I took her to a board game store and said, here are some titles that I like. I pointed out some uh, Avalon Hill games. I don't think they're made anymore, but that was what I was interested in at the time. And the clerk there overheard us talking and he heard a bit about what I like and he asked if I had ever played Diplomacy. And I said, no, I haven't played that one. And he raved about it, he loved it. So I decided to give it a try. I bought it for myself because I didn't end up getting it for Christmas and put together a little group with some friends. We probably played four or five games, but we had the hardest time getting exactly seven people to play. So I was really interested in it. Not all my friends were. So I started looking for online sources and I found a few and I played it off and on, but they weren't always that reliable to play online. People frequently dropped out and I found that frustrating. So sometimes I gave it up and then I'd come back to it. But in law school, I decided to give it up entirely. I wanted to take my law school studies seriously. So for a few years there, I didn't play at all. And then last year, one of my friends from college wrote me an email in March and said he was putting together a diplomacy game, what I like to play. Well, unfortunately, he sent it to a really old email account, one of mine that I hadn't used really since college. So I didn't get it for about two months and I didn't get to join that game, but I got to join the next game and I remembered how much I loved it. And so I immediately started looking for other sources to play. And I was mostly playing online only with complete strangers on Backstabber, but somehow Bill Hackenbrack found me and wanted me to play in Liberty Cup. And so I, signed up for Liberty Cup and I did well enough that I was happy with my result and I've been playing in tournaments since last August pretty regularly. So we have Bill Hackenbrack to blame for Natty Shea for being in the hobby, which uh, I, wish you'd, I wish I could say you're unique on that, but you're not. He's been doing a lot of evangelizing in the last 12 months. It seems that way. He seems to look for people everywhere and that's where he found me. Well, we're, we're, we're glad to have you. I, I speak for, I think, everybody who's ever played with you, dealt with you. We're glad to have you. So, Thank you. 
I wanted to bring you on the show to talk a little bit about something that's happening on Bill Hackenbrack's, you know, the one, the, the Discord server that he started, the VWDC, something called Masterclass, which I've mentioned before in previous episodes of Deadline, but I wanted you to maybe tell our viewers a little more detail what Masterclass is. So Masterclass is a way for intermediate and possibly beginner players to interact with someone who is a master at the game of diplomacy. The person who is leading the discussion can choose a subject and talk a bit about what they think or would like you to know about that subject. But because it's on Discord, people can ask questions, they can interject their thoughts. It makes it more of a round table discussion. Whereas there are other places you can go to learn about diplomacy and read articles or listen to podcasts. But because of the nature of Masterclass, you can talk to the person yourself and ask questions, questions specific to your situation if you want. You can provide links to your own game and ask the leader of the class what they would have done differently or if they did anything wrong at all. Uh, Sometimes you just get a position that there's nothing that can be saved. But by getting another person's thoughts or several people's thoughts, because other people, even the person not leading the discussion, are allowed to interject and say, that's interesting. I've even played with that person. I would have done X, well, you did Y. So it's an audio sort of discussion uh, led by a particular master of the game. And how right. often do you, how often do you do it and when do you do it? We try to meet each Sunday and it's for about an hour. Sometimes it goes a little bit longer, starting at noon Eastern time. That's uh, 10 a.m. for me, might be 9 a.m. for Adam Silverman, who led our last discussion, or wherever you're at. But uh, there will be another one this coming Sunday, led by Brother Board. So that would be Sunday, April 18th, right? That's correct. <clears throat> and do you know what the topic is for this Sunday? He is going to be talking about detecting lies, both in diplomacy and in out. He said once in one of his diplomacy broadcasts that he has gotten very good at telling when people are lying to him, even if it's not in the game of diplomacy. Well, you mentioned Adam Silverman. Uh, if, if you don't mind, mention some other folks who have led the masterclass discussion and the topics they covered. We've also had Dave Maletsky lead a discussion. He did a discussion on grand strategy, and he set forth another way one might play. Instead of alliance play, he put forth more of a short-term agreements type way of playing diplomacy. Adam Silverman talked about stalemate lines and the many places where the board can get uh, locked up if, if you're looking to lock it up to defend yourself or if you're looking to get past those stalemate lines if you're trying to win the game in solo. Morgante Pell is one of the founders of Masterclass and he has probably led the most discussions. He gave a great discussion on how to play Turkey. He also had a discussion on 50-50 guesses and another discussion on Italian openings. It just like sounds like a great series of topics and a great series of discussion leaders. Um, any final thoughts for our audience about why they ought to tune in to Masterclass on Sundays on the VWDC Discord server? My final thought is that it is what you make of it. If you have a burning question, you can really drive the direction the discussion goes by participating and giving the leader your thoughts. And hopefully we will be able to get some other interesting correspondence on our master class. I'm always looking for people who have interesting perspectives and experience in the game of diplomacy to lead a discussion. Oh, that sounds great. I appreciate you being on the, on deadline, Natty, to tell our viewers about this wonderful opportunity to learn more about the game and interact with, with uh, hobbyists. Thank you. Thank you for having me, David. All right. See you, Natty. The last four weeks have seen outstanding new content from DBN's media partners out there on the interwebs. 
Among several recent diplomacy-related videos released by Legendary Tactics, their series continues on how to win with each great power, with the latest one being Russ Dennis about how to play England. The Diplomats podcast was taken over by guest commentators since primary host of the Diplomats, Ed Sullivan, was playing in the Nexus Speedboat final that was being analyzed on the show. Florida Man and the Diplomacy Briefing both had awesome April Fool's content for their listeners. While the Diplomacy Games podcast featured an interview with Jamal Blackerley, the winner of the most recent face-to-face -face tournament in the world, the one in Melbourne, Australia, Poppycon. For links to these and other DIP content creators, visit the North American Diplomacy Federation website at the nadf.org, where all of these content creators are listed. The latest issue of Diplomacy World, number 153, dropped on April 2nd. Editor Doug Kent has compiled an interesting series of articles for this edition with topics including the search for the worst variant ever, tournament reports from the VWDC, the Cascadia and the DBN Invitational, and a very entertaining set of limericks from Harold Reynolds themed around each space on the diplomacy board. Kent is also seeking new contributors, editors, and demo game players, including club and tournament editor, feel like somebody mentioned that earlier in this broadcast. Check out the latest magazine at www.diplomacyworld.net and then get more involved in your hobby by contacting Doug Kent about how you can help. There is a new speedboat league specifically designed for our friends in Europe and down under. The Euro Asia Pacific Speedboat League began April 1st with a season to extend through the end of March 2022. It'll be scored using the Bangkok scoring system with games ending in fall 1909. The games will be played monthly on Backstabber. For more information, visit the link below where one of the three league organizers, Leigh Sarlanen, has posted additional information. Wait a minute, you don't know what Speedboat is? and you don't know that there's already a speedboat league that's been playing for months, let's fix all that by talking to Eber Condrill, a hobbyist in Colorado, and one of the speedboat league administrators on the Nexus Discord server. Eber, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. You got it. Tell us a little bit about your diplomacy origin story, first of all. Well, I first started playing diplomacy when I was maybe 11 or 12 um, in China with some friends. Um, and that's just how I started for the for a few years. I played just with friends and then uh, found V Diplomacy online, started playing there. Um, and then this past year, when all the tournaments went virtual, I started playing with them. Um, I also played for a few a few times in the uh, with the Windy City Weasels in Chicago. Yeah, so if you went to V Diplomacy as your first website, did you have a particular interest in variants from early on? Well, as a as a fifteen year old, it uh, looked more interesting than web diplomacy. So, and I wasn't interested in paying any money like uh, on play diplomacy. So that that's that was my that was my decision process. So it's not a bad decision process at all. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what Speedboat is for some of our viewers who may not have played it before. A uh, speedboat is a variant of diplomacy. Um, it's the boat element is uh, just like gunboat, so no no negotiations at all. Um, and then most most gunboat games are played with twenty four hour turns uh, on on the internet, um, but speedboat is played with five minute turns, um, and either online or in person. But right now, obviously, it's online. And so have you been playing Speedboat for, for a long period of time at this point? Pretty much since, uh, well, a few people started playing Speedboat in the summer uh, casually. And then since September, the uh, Nexus has had a Speedboat League. Tell us a little bit about what Nexus is and then tell us about the Speedboat League and how it's set up. Uh, so Nexus is a community, uh, an online diplomacy community that's sort of dedicated to bringing people together from all the different platforms online um, and having them participate together in tournaments and leagues. Um, so it started out as just a full press league, or a tournament rather, and then they added a gumboat tournament, a Cold War variant, which is a two-player variant tournament, and now a speedboat league. Um, 
So it's mainly around uh, the main purpose of Nexus is to get as many people together as possible and sort of help people branch out into maybe places that aren't their comfort zone, like other websites they're not used to using. Well, tell us how the Speedboat League itself is set up. It looks to me like there are seasons that are basically a couple of months worth of seasons, and then you've got a top board or a final. So tell us just a little bit about, about the setup. So essentially we have a, a six-week season. Well, we're talking about making it eight weeks again, but it's it's about about two months. Um, and during that time, players are able to play any Speedboat games whenever they want, uh, as long as you can get seven players together. Um, those games will be scored under mind the gap scoring um and then who the top seven players from the duration of the league uh will participate in a top board um sometimes uh consisting of multiple games um at that at the end of that season period and that player will be crowned the the champion of that uh league or that uh, but that particular season of the league yes yes so it looks to me, I was just watching on the Diplomats uh, series that they had just covered this. The, was that the January, February season? For yeah, it took, us, it, it took us about a month to organize a finals game for that since about half the players could only play on weekdays and half the players could only play on weekends. But eventually they got, a, they got uh, times figured out. And it looked to me like it might have been a two-game final Yes, so this this month we played a two game final that was the same for the November December. Um, we got two games organized, and that the idea is to sort of mitigate any uh, randomness that happens with speedboat because depending on what power you're assigned uh, and just circumstances in the game, you can get totally destroyed for no fault of your own. Um, so two games was designed to allow players to have more opportunities, but Pez just uh, Pez Demer just completely. Uh, railroaded both games so it didn't matter anyway so he's the february january february season champion that's correct and it, do you remember who some other champions have been so far just let's name drop a little bit um december november excuse me november december champion was a uh, evr estachio really i don't know how to pronounce his name um, you you know a lot about that don't you? <laughs> um, i do um and then September, a, October not was a, a not a memory quiz. So yeah, that was a chat named Borgigan. Oh yeah, but um, that's those those are a few of the champions so far. Well, if somebody's watching this and wants to be involved in Speedboat, um, how do they do that? Well, you just have to hop over to the Nexus Discord server. Um, once you get there, you can go to a channel called Roles and select the Speedboat role, which will allow you to see all the Speedboat categories uh, or all the Speedboat channels. Um, from there, you can uh, join games whenever they happen. Uh, it's a first come, first serve basis, and joining games on Backstabber. Um, people, that don't worry if you if you select the speedboat role, you get a lot of uh, at speedboater pings. Pretty much, I don't know, a dozen a day. And <laughs> sometimes, um, some people say it can get annoying. I think it's fine, but uh, if if you want to play speedboat, Nexus is the place. And we will put a, a link to the to the Discord server or an invite to the Discord server in this in this podcast. So uh, if somebody uh, uh, got onto the Nexus thing, was sort of stumbling around as some of us do when we're trying to learn new things, could they reach out to you? Or are you one of the administrators of the league or or, or commissioner? Yeah, they could reach out to me um, on Discord. Um, they could reach out to Saren, uh, JJ Raymond, pretty much. Those are the we're sort of the three moderators. There's a few other people who are like the the crew members, um, and any of us will be w hap, uh, ready and willing to answer any questions you have um, or get you set up. So, well, I appreciate you telling this uh, story to our viewership. Uh, any final pitch to people about try try speedboat and why? Um, speedboat is a it's a tighter feedback loop than other forms of diplomacy. Um, well, specifically than other extended ten, like extended deadline diplomacy. Um, so if you want to learn and learn fast, uh, Speedboat is the place to do it. All right. Thanks, Eber. Appreciate you being on the show. And now for this month's panel discussion, we focus on the interplay between the ethics of diplomacy and the ethics of the real world. Joining us are Russ Dennis of Michigan, 
known as Humble the Heap online, Alex Maslow from Massachusetts, and Virginia hobbyist Claude Worrell. Fellas, welcome to the program. And let's start with some background on the perspectives that each of these panelists bring to the topic. So Russ, tell us a little bit about your life away from diplomacy, if you would. Yes, yeah, so I have a wonderful wife, two little ones that are the joy of our lives. Um, I enjoy uh, really playing a lot of different musical instruments, but a fingerstyle guitar would be one, but concertina, ocarina, a, a lot of different things. I kind of have some interest there and a lot of different hobbies. And um, I, I'm also a pastor here in Michigan, and I consider that a calling, not a profession. And it's the passion of my life. I got into it because of really working with um, a lot of uh, kids ministries in the inner city. And that's kind of what was initially my thought in going into the ministry. And I'm now a lead pastor here in Michigan. Great. Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself outside of diplomacy, if you would. Sure, David. All right. Thanks for having me on. So I work with uh, for a nonprofit with adults with developmental disabilities. And in normal times, we help them try to get social skills and job skills so they can succeed personally and professionally. Nowadays, we just kind of help them pass time in stimulating ways like going on virtual museum tours. I also run the Jewish Life Programming for the Jewish clients that we have. We had a lot of online celebrations last year. And for Passover, this past week even, we were able to have something in person. We were lucky enough up in Boston here to have a really nice day. Uh, socially distanced masked, of course. I used to be a, a teacher and I worked in a few Jewish day schools and supplementary Hebrew schools. And uh, I have a dual master's in Jewish education and Jewish studies. Great. And Claude, I thought your profession would give us some interesting perspective. So tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Well, <clears throat> I'm a trial court judge in Virginia. Um, in circuit court, we hear everything. Divorces, custody, visitation, criminal matters. We hear civil disputes between landlord, tenants, medical malpractice. Anything you can put in front of the jury, we do. Um, before that, I spent 24, 25 years practicing law in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, and was a prosecutor for most of that time, um, representing the Commonwealth, Commonwealth's Attorney's Office and prosecuting murder, rape, and robbery and things like that. Um, and so we've got a lot of um, general experience also in the ethical realm because I spent four years in assistant bar counsel prosecuting lawyers for violating the rules of professional conduct. I appreciate all that background, but most importantly, you all three of you are diplomacy people, which is why you're on this TV, uh, why you're on this TV show. So following up on that, Claude, uh, obviously as a judge and a lawyer, you have ethical rules and you just described that in one of your other jobs. You have ethical rules and traditions which inform both your behavior and those of the folks that appear before you. Do you think diplomacy has any such ethical constraints given the nature of the game? You know, I don't really believe that it does. I think diplomacy is a world unto itself with the rules and conventions that exist amongst people that play a lot. For example, um, I play with a group of guys up in DC from time to time and there's a way in which that game is approached and the, um, uh, the straightforwardness of negotiations in that game. There have been times at DixieCon, for example, where in the first two minutes of uh, diplomacy negotiations, I was lied to by every player on the board for a variety of reasons and for a variety of purposes. And then they got mad at me because, as it turned out, I didn't lie to them right away. Um, and so diplomacy is a little bit different. Those of us involved in law, at least for me, we have very strict rules about telling the truth and being honest and you know, forthright, especially in front of a judge and in front of a jury of peers that you want to do something. It's really important that you can, that you, um, sort of demonstrate your credibility at all times and are trusted at all times as somebody who's going to tell the truth no matter whether or not it hurts you or helps you. And diplomacy isn't always that way. There are times in diplomacy when you are um, forced 
um, based on the circumstances of the board and the circumstances of your relationships that exist only within the context of the board and those relationships to say things you wouldn't ordinarily say in real life. And diplomacy life is therefore just a bit different. Russ, how about you? What do you see as a way to reconcile the behaviors that people do in a dip game and the behaviors that we think of in the Christian tradition that we think of as, as good behavior? Well, there is a lot of tension there. You know, Christians are called to love their neighbors as their self. Uh, they're called to even love their enemies. They're called to be truthful, to not tell lies or deceive. And so um, there is tension. And I know sometimes um, people can easily compartmentalize it, but um, it, it, it can be difficult. Diplomacy by its very nature breeds conflict. Now, uh, that's not unusual for a game. I mean, there's for instance, risk, your your goal is to take over the entire world. So uh, you're going to attack everybody. People know that. Uh, you know, Monopoly, the, the point of Monopoly is to bankrupt everyone. So uh, there's lots of games that are zero sum in the sense that if you do well, someone's going to do worse. But what makes diplomacy so difficult is that it can get so personal. You know, you build alliances and at the end of the day, the end goal is to solo. That's that's how the creator, Alan Callhammer, made the game. And there's not very many ways to solo without attacking your ally. Um, there's, I suppose, in, in maybe a way to do it. But generally speaking, if you're going to solo, that's what you have to do. And no one likes betrayal. And uh, there's a certain sense in diplomacy that... Um, even just a, a, a small side of deception is baked into it, whether you're not giving all the information to your ally or you're slowing down your ally perhaps in another way. And even people that say that they're not going to lie um, are even fooling themselves because I've, I've encountered people that, that say that they're, they're never going to uh, do any kind of betrayal like that or they'll never tell an outright lie, but they deceive all the time. And uh, from... From the Christian tradition, you know, you may not say the words, but if you are purposely trying to get someone to believe something that is not true, uh, it, it's just as bad. So, um, you know, even the biggest Care Bear, uh, they're going to stab for a world championship. And we've, we've seen those kind of things happen. So the question, how do I reconcile it? Well, um, along the lines of what Claude said, uh, there is definitely an aspect that understand what the rules of the game are. Um, the, by its nature, it necessitates a constant reevaluation of the alliances. Um, it, in fact, in the original 1959 rules, it states that um, any of the rules do not bind a player to anything he says, um, and deciding whom to trust as a situation arises is part of the game. You know, the tagline that Alan Cowhammer actually originally had was diplomacy, the game with the human element. And so that's really important to me on reconciling as a Christian how to play the game. Um, how you treat people is vital. Uh, there's, there's a big difference between the mechanics of the game and um, the tactics of the game, um, how you try to make it happen, and how you treat people. And so um, I think not just how do you respond if you get attacked, but how do you respond when someone gets upset at you that you're attacking them? Those both are very, very important because people are going to be upset and being able to take that with grace and responding grace is really, really important. And I think that's another way, uh, reason that after game discussions are so important because um, there's going to be frustrations during the game. There's going to be um, there's going to be, uh, you know, times that you're trying to push whatever uh, the viewpoint you have. And so um, you don't always know how you're being perceived. And uh, that can be one of the difficulties in diplomacy. Um, I, I think the vast majority of people that play, I know it's not everybody, but the vast majority of people that play don't want to make it a, a personal experience and make things personal. And so being able to have a conversation after the game and and find out kind of, you know, how you were perceived, if there was any problems, is really, really important. Or just to talk and explain the decisions you make. And so the biggest way I try to reconcile all of this is by treating people um, 
treating people kindly um, without being, um, you know, name calling and these kind of things. And, you know, if I don't live up to that, trying to make that right after the game, that's very, very important for me. That's fair. Alex, Alex how about your, your particular religious tradition? Uh, does it affect the way you in, interact with diplomacy hobbyists, either on the board or off the board? Yeah, definitely. I, I'd say the main thing that I keep in mind is there's a prohibition against embarrassing people. You know, when someone's embarrassed, their face turns red because blood is rushing up to it, or sometimes it'll turn white because blood's rushing away. Either way, the blood's going to move in, in an unusual way. And then in the Talmud, the rabbis say this is to be interpreted as if we're spilling blood, and it's sort of compared as as bad as murdering someone. So that's the prohibition that I take very seriously on and off the board, really just in my, my whole life. But especially at diplomacy events, because for better or for worse, diplomacy events are full of smart people who know they're smart and they want to be known as being smart. So people's egos are very important and they can get really defensive about it if they feel it's being questioned. So in game, what this means is I try to be very careful about getting my point across. You know, I don't want to talk down to someone, but I also don't want to talk over their head because then they'll have to ask a question and they may feel stupid needing to ask a question and they'll feel embarrassed. So let's say that I want to make a Western triple with two people. And I'll assume that they know what it is and how to play it, unless for some reason I specifically know that, you know, one of the players is very new. But I'll also specifically encourage that we ask questions and that we talk about things. So after negotiations, instead of saying, hey, any questions, which is kind of like a flippant thing to say at the end, um, I'll say, all right, guys, we want to get this right. So let's make sure that we're on the same page. Is there anything that we want to double check? And so sometimes even I'll, I'll say something that I don't want to double check, I know, but I just want to open up the floor and say, hey, here's something that I want to double check. I think double checking is okay. And then that way the other people may feel more comfortable bringing things up. Alex, you may have seen the blood rush from my face when you proposed a Western triple. I have to just throw that out there. <laughs> that may have been what happened there. But let me go back to you just a minute, Russ. Um, there's an old saying in the hobby that diplomacy ruins friendships. Is the nature of this game inherently anti-ethical or in any other way harmful to our humanity, do you think? And if so, what could we do about it? Well, I think one of the fundamental questions to, to deal with that is why do you play diplomacy? Because that's going to dictate a lot how you interact with people. You know, as Alex was saying, uh, ego it can be a very big part of the game. And if you're playing purely for ego to show that you're smarter or better or more talented than other people, then that human element, um, that aspect of humanity is, is going to be, it's only going to matter to you in so much as it gets you the win. And so, you know, like personally, like I really enjoy diplomacy because of the unique challenges that it has and um, also because of the personalities that it attracts. But um, one of the things about diplomacy and when you're speaking about ethics and all that, too, is um, the fact that, too, diplomacy teaches you, I think, a lot about yourself. And just to be transparent and kind of tell a story from, uh, from my own life with diplomacy, uh, a few years ago, I was uh, playing in the Nexus finals and it was the second season. And for those that are familiar with it, Nexus is a place where um, people from a lot of different online platforms come together and they do a tournament. They do two of them a year and you usually play about three months and then you, the top seven get into the finals. There's usually about uh, anywhere, at least during those times, there was about a hundred players. And so it's, it, I'd played three games to get in. They were three games that, um, you know, took a lot of time, a lot of writing. And so we get into the finals and of course, everybody really wants to win. We're all very competitive. Um, we're all spending too much time <laughs> writing and the game was time limited. 1910 was when it ended. And I think we were probably about 1906, 1907. I was Turkey and the English player was requesting my help into Moscow. And I was kind of going back and forth and I finally decided to do it. And the English player, um, he, uh, you know, made, of course, all kinds of promises about, you know, what the end game was going to mean and, you know, how grateful he would be. And the next turn, he collapsed my position. <laughs> he supported Austria against me. And in the 
and, and it didn't help him. It actually set Austria up to eventually win that game. And, and he did that. And in the time limited amount with, with the moves that happened, you know, I, I realized at that moment that I wasn't going to be able to win. And with all that time I put in, not just getting there, but in that final itself, um, it felt terrible. <laughs> it was a huge letdown. And I remember be wanting him to feel as bad as I felt in that moment. And uh, so I didn't, you know, call him names. I didn't, uh, you know, cuss him out or anything, but um, I laid the guilt on him. And uh, he definitely did feel guilty. And, uh, you know, eventually then, of course, uh, that just devolves into, you know, of course, uh, then him getting upset with me, which is rightfully so. And when that game came to an end, I remember thinking to myself, you know, that's something that I don't, I don't ever, that's not the person I want to be. I don't want to want to make somebody feel bad, regardless of what happens on the board. And, um, you know, the great thing about it is that player, um, which many people will know um, now is uh, at, because he's in the virtual scene is Ed Sullivan. But um, we didn't just become good diplomacy friends coming out of that. Um, he's a good friend. And so that's one of the things I think that sometimes is missed about diplomacy is that for the people that enjoy this game, diplomacy can be a great place to make friends. And, you know, if you click with someone and that friendship continues after you clear the blood from the board, you know, you found a friend for life. And so I don't think it's harmful to humanity. Um, it's just important that you have the right people that can enjoy the game, enjoy the challenges of the game, and also are there to make sure that it's you want other people to have a good time, too. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Claude, let, let me go to you on, on that point for a minute. He's talking about behaviors that people, and in fact, he said he had a piece of behavior that he would like to have changed and he sort of atoned for later. Do you ever see behavior in diplomacy, either in the game or in the hobby, that if those folks were in your courtroom, you'd have blown the whistle on them and said, no, you can't do that. You can't act like that. The times I see those kinds of things are in relatively tense positions on the board and one player starts yelling or screaming at another um, and trying to bully them into or make them feel small or take advantage of them in some way, shape, or form. There are some folks that are playing diplomacy, and I think I'm one of those people, that approach the game as its only business, its only this game, that this isn't personal, that they haven't lied to me, they haven't stabbed me in the back because they dislike me particularly. Um, but that um, it's just in the context of this game, this particular game on this particular board, this is the way it worked out. I think that there are certain people that are willing to play bad positions out. If you look at the list of people at DixieCon or some of the other where they give the award away for death with, with dignity, you find that those are the people that are going to be able to navigate the world of diplomacy as much as they want to win. And as much as they want to compete and much as they want to be at the top of the board are willing to accept what's happening um, at face value and not project something else into it. But there are certain players that really try to impose their will upon not only another player on the board, but the whole board itself and sort of wreck the experience for everyone. And those kinds of folks often make me think that somebody needs to get hauled away for contempt of court and spend 10 days in jail because they just have lost the spirit of this process. One of the things that I think is great about the game, and I think that the ability to make friendships is to a degree unparalleled of the diplomacy community because it's relatively small. If you've traveled to DixieCon, for example, and before we get, began, David made a point about saying that there are certain local people that come to DixieCon. Well, there's a certain crew of guys that come to play at DixieCon and one or two women that I love to see every year. It's the only place I really get to spend time with them. They're interesting, they're funny, they're caring people in general away from the diplomacy board perfectly lovely human beings. 
Um, and the community is too small to really um, uh, go too far overboard because what happens then, I think, is nobody wants to play with you. Nobody wants to be your ally, no matter whether it's advantageous to them or not. So David Hood's on the board with you and you say Western triple, David laughs at you and immediately you go to Germany and say, let's kill England, David right now, because he's a huge pain in the backside. We don't want him on the board any longer than we have to. Um, so, I mean, there is an um, inevitable series of behaviors for those who try to um, be too impositional um, upon everybody else. And the imposition they place on the other folks on the board is just untenable. And those are the kinds of people that I would like to be able to haul off and say, you not now. You need to go have a time out and sit in the corner. Hmm. Well, you know, you, you may be onto something there. If, if we if that does happen in one of my tournaments and you're there, I may I may turn to you and, and ask for a <laughs> citation. I mean, you're you you're you're legally allowed to give them. So I, I, we may do that. Well, Alex, I mean, that. As long as we're in Virginia, I can do something. As well, long as we're in North Carolina, I'm just a guy. Well, they don't know that. <laughs> well, they, they're, this is on a need to know basis. Alex, let me, let me come back to you. <clears throat> you have participated in the diplomacy hobby now for a while. Uh, have you seen changes over time? Uh, in your experience regarding what conduct that folks think is ethical or acceptable, or maybe there's some some conduct which Judaism says that folks should refrain from. T talk to us about that. So I'm not really sure if it's just because I'm older and have gotten a bit chiller and have kind of figured out how to manage my ego in terms of diplomacy, because I remember when I started, things felt, I started when I, I mean, I started when I was 13 or 14 is when I learned diplomacy. And then around 20, 21, 22 is when I started uh, tournament diplomacy. And I think anyone who's been 21, 22 uh, and then isn't realizes that the things they did at 21, 22 and the things that they cared about, not always the best thing. So I don't know if it's because I'm a bit older now or because the the, the people who were making tr trouble are older now, but obviously now they're new, younger people. But I think especially things have gotten better. Is, is sort of where what I'm driving at. From what I remember, at least, it was much harsher, much more visceral. It could get personal and uh, cruel kind of more often. And things that I've heard from before my time of uh, not really personal issues, but like the tricks that were used in the old postal games seem ludicrously uh, out of line now. And so I think that there is an element of people are a bit more mindful of what is, uh, not mindful of what is right and what is wrong, but they are, they have a more wholesome and a more all encompassing idea of what is right and what is wrong. And while I think that most of us seem to agree from what we've been saying, that diplomacy sometimes can be kind of a world unto itself, there are a lot of newer players who have the view that everything is interconnected. And because of that, we should, be extra, you know, nice in this game that not not nice. Hang on. That we should be extra mindful in this game of how we treat people because it's such an intense experience and, be, and can be such an emotional thing. There's a really great story in the Talmud about these four rabbis who are arguing. It's one against three, and in rabbinic ar arguments, majority rules. But this one guy is really, really sure, and he keeps on going on and on. And at some point. God, God's self comes down and says, this one rabbi is actually right. Three of you are wrong. And uh, the three rabbis basically say, okay, now it's two against three. We still win. The, the, the lesson being that people lead Judaism. And for us, the right, lesson being that, that the people in the community get to make the rules. That um, we can talk about what is actually ethical and what we think is the right way to do things. But ultimately, the people in the community a, need to agree on those things, whether explicitly or implicitly. A lot of tournaments uh, recently have started having, you know, codes of conduct and really spelling things out. But even without those, there's sort of, you know, we all would agree you can't punch someone. You can't actually stab someone with a knife. That's always supposed to be a metaphor. 
which sounds kind of ludicrous to say out loud, but these are things that in the rules don't actually exist in the old Alan Calamer rules that Russ was referring to earlier. And so I think that it's really important that we take, uh, that we let the community lead things and that that means things are going to change and that occasionally they're going to be some kind of growing pains, but trying to swing in with rules is going to have less success rather than having the community drive it. And part of that means that it's going to change. But Judaism really thrives on innovation. And I think that the diplomacy hobby has been doing that and should continue to do that. Which may be the first and maybe last time that Judaism and diplomacy are ever linked together in that direct of a fashion. But I'm <laughs> glad that it happened right here on Deadline News. Claude, give us your final thoughts about how interpersonal interactions in diplomacy can be seen by others as being either ethical or, unec un or unethical in your experience. I don't know if any of you will remember this, but there was a, an article that was written where a real diplomat came to a diplomacy tournament and observed the diplomacy tournament. And one of the things that I took away from that was that what he was seeing was really good diplomacy at a relatively high level. And his values, as he imposed them, as he viewed this diplomacy game taking place, really sort of informed at least the way I was thinking about the ethics of the diplomacy board. And while I said before that diplomacy is in and of itself a world unto itself, there are some things that are recognizable to the outside world as ethical or unethical as we engage in this game of diplomacy. And I think they're readily apparent largely because we all come from the same basic Judeo-Christian thoughts that even go beyond Judaism and Christianity, but are also found in all of the other religions where truth is valued, fair dealing is valued, and appropriateness in a situation is valued. And you can find that on a diplomacy board too. And so in spite of what I said before, that there really aren't any rules in diplomacy, that's not really true. It really is a um, community that decides what's acceptable and what's not. And it's, in, it's within those bounds, we make determinations about how well we're going to play with somebody, whether we want to work with somebody or not work with somebody, because ultimately we're trying to look for somebody for at least the short term in a diplomacy game that is trustworthy enough to spend a few years with and do a few things so that you both grow and gain a few supply centers. If it lasts longer than that, you've done a beautiful job. But if you can make it last two or three years, that's um, pretty impressive. Because I think you were right when you said earlier that who wouldn't stab somebody if they were looking for a solo win at the World Championship? I know I would. I suspect every one of us would. It's a rare person to think that um, we will see that person say, you know what? We said we were going to do this together. And even though I can stab you now for three more supply centers and win this thing, you know what? I'm not going to because I made a promise at the beginning. Um, I think that diplomacy is a beautiful game, and I think the relationships found within the context of that game, both on and off the board, as long as we remember it, it's still just a game, really can be quite enduring and really quite ethical for the periods of time that we have relationships with the other people on the board. That, that's well said. That's, I appreciate that. Alex, how about you? Um, is there a particular Jewish text, which you think gets at the core of, of ethical diplomacy play? Definitely. I, I think so. So Jews are encouraged to disagree and even argue. I mean, we just had Passover and all the seders that I went to, there were disagreements about interpretations about this or that symbol or uh, part of the story. But we're encouraged to argue the, the phrases for the sake of heaven. We argue to arrive at the truth or at least to sort of enhance our understanding not supposed to get personal and it's not supposed to sort of remain beyond the actual discussion. And I think that's really the key. We all play a very nerdy game with a very, very small circle. It's quite large in terms of, I think, 
numbers in terms of what we each have in our own local area, but as part of even just gaming, it's a pretty small circle. And it's a hard hobby to, to grow. I've introduced it to, I think, probably 20 people in my life. I think it's really only stuck with three or four. And so being cruel might win you a game or possibly win you one tournament, but cruelty doesn't really contribute to the hobby and really harms it. So I think ultimately we need to play for the, uh, I'll take the term, play for the sake of heaven and not let our love of the game's darker aspects, which rightly belong in the games, but don't belong in the community itself. From your uh, lips to the hearts of our hobbyists, I, I really appreciate what you just said. Russ, let me, um, let, me go, let me go last word to you. For hobbyists of whatever religious or secular view of ethics, whatever, how can we simply be better people as we participate in this diplomacy hobby? Yeah, I, I think learning how to uh, handle conflict is important. I mean, that's part of, you know, what it, being adult, an adult is all about. Um, and diplomacy is a, has a great mechanic where it brings conflict in. And so you get to learn about yourself, how you handle conflict. And through that, you learn how to, to uh, attack the problem and not the person. And that's very, very important in life. You know, that's how issues get resolved and how you keep you know, things from just becoming toxic. And generally speaking, right, you know, we naturally don't look at things from other people's perspective. Um, we, there's always gonna be people that always think that they're always right. And I think in some ways that can be our default. And so learning how to step into somebody else's shoes and, and learning how to pursue, I would say a sense of humility is really, really important. And in a broader hobby sense, kind of to piggyback what Alex was saying, um, it's, it, I would say those core values are, are even more important. Uh, the hobby has had huge setbacks in the past where it's devolved into different camps because of personality conflicts or someone didn't get their way. And so, you know, they're going to pack up their things and go home. And I think we got it. We need to realize that what we're trying to do is bigger than winning a game. It's bigger than winning an argument. You know, Harry Truman said, it's amazing what can be accomplished when everyone doesn't care who gets the credit. And we are at a great moment in diplomacy history where there can be tremendous growth um, on every level. And so we need to strive to keep the peace and be willing to, you know, let petty things go and work together uh, to see this hobby become more healthy, more fun for everyone. And through that, I think um, a better community. You know, it's, it's, it's great to have a place where people from different backgrounds, different belief systems um, can come together and just have fun. I think that's something that this world needs. And, and so if we can develop that, um, I think then it would make for a, a very, very healthy hobby. And also, I think just a better I think it helps make us better people because of it. Russ, I really appreciate that. And Claude and Alex, appreciate your, your insights very much. You lying bunch of blankety blanks. Uh, I really <laughs> appreciate you, really appreciate you being on the show. And I hope that our uh, viewership enjoyed this conversation. All right. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. This is great. Thank you. And thanks to all of you watching at home. We hope you have enjoyed this broadcast of Deadline. If you have news, ideas for features, or feedback of any kind, please feel free to send an email to info at diplobn.com, or you can drop me a line directly using davidhood at dixicon.com. For all of our other broadcast offerings, visit our website at diplobn.com. This is David Hood signing off. I wish you brightness and bliss, and, of course, Belgium.